Okay, let's begin. So we are up to chapter 7. Temperament and circumstances. So those of you who were here last month, remember we went over chapter 6. It was quite long. And we talked about this uh, teachings of the Six Patriarch. And now we go to chapter 7, which is temperament and circumstances. This means he's meeting various people. Chapter 6 was on repentance. We talked a lot about that last time. But chapter 7 is his interaction with the other people. And those of you who are new today, um, we're going through this book on the Sixth Patriarch. Uh, he's the Zen master who is the founder of the Zen school in China and also in Korea. And we're looking at, we're on page 200, chapter 7, page 200 in this book. And one thing we see here is that he was uh, still unknown, the patriarch was still unknown, and he went back to his village uh, in Xu Chao from Wang Mu, where the Dharma had been transmitted to him. Uh, so he left uh, the place where the fifth patriarch uh, gave him the Dharma, and he returned to his original uh, village where he lived, which is in southern China, uh, near Canton. And he had many interaction with various people, and that's what this chapter is about. Temperament and circumstances, different interactions with different people and different kind of, uh, the way he answered their questions is mentioned in here. And one uh, nun who was there uh, was her name, was a Wu Jinzang here, Inexhaustible Treasury. And she was reciting the Nirvana Sutra. And after hearing her recitation for a short time, only a short time, he understood its profound meaning and began explaining it. So this is interesting because he was illiterate. He could not read Chinese. He didn't understand Chinese characters. He was illiterate, but just hearing the recitation of the sutra, he understood its meaning, and he understood its uh, deeper meaning. And so he said, I am illiterate, but if you wish to know the meaning, please ask. And she asked, how can you grasp the meaning of the text when you do not even know the words? And to this he replied, the profundity, the profundity of the teaching of the various Buddhas has nothing to do with written language. This was a, quite a surprising answer for him to give. Basically, he was saying that the, the truth can't be contained in language. And so that he could, uh, even he could explain the sutra without being able to read it. It's as if I was to give you this lecture today, but I could not read English. I could not read this book. It's almost like that. Just by hearing it, he was able to understand it. So she was quite surprised, and she told the elder of the village, this is a holy man. We should ask him to stay and get his permission to supply him with food and lodging. So she recognized that he was not an ordinary monk and said, this is a holy man. <laughs> and uh, so this is, this is how, in one way, he was welcome in that village and well taken care of. And he stayed there for quite some time, and many people came in to pay homage to him, and he rebuilt the, the people around that there rebuilt the uh, historical Paolin Monastery. 
and they rebuilt it for the patriarch. And it became a very famous temple. But after nine months, the patriarch's enemies found him again. What does that mean, his enemies found him? There were many people who were jealous of him and who were angry that he received the robe and received the transmission of the robe and the bowls from the fifth patriarch. And they were trying to catch him and steal these items. They only understood the material. They didn't understand that these were only symbols. They thought that the, by owning this robe and by owning these bowls that they would have the Dharma, but they didn't understand that these were symbols of the Dharma. So that's quite a difference, the symbol and actually having the Dharma. And so after about nine months, he had to leave and he went into the forest and he hid between some rocks and he was able to escape. And one of the rocks, known as the Rock of Refuge, still has some imprint of his robe there. And so he uh, made these two districts of the Hui and Hui, uh, his places of retreat and teaching. And at some point, um, one Piku came to him, a native of... Uh, some other area, came to him and asked him about the meaning of mind is Buddha. And the patriarch replied, to not give rise to thinking is mind, to not distinguish thought is Buddha. He gave a very simple explanation, but then he said, if I were to give you a more full explanation, the topic could not be exhausted, even if I used a whole kalpa. A whole kalpa means quite a long time, a million years. And so uh, he explained it as just saying that not giving rise to thinking is the true mind and not extinguishing thought is the Buddha. Not pushing away thought is the Buddha itself. And he went on to make a poem about that. Uh, this poem about what mind is, what Buddha is. When practicing prajna and samadhi should function together. Then our thoughts will be clear, pure and clear. This teaching can be attained only through the habit of practice. Its function is essentially without birth. To use prajna and samadhi together is correct practice. So those of you who were not here earlier, we already talked about this. Prajna is wisdom. Samadhi is meditation. So prajna and samadhi need to be practiced together. If you only have a wisdom, but you don't have meditation, then it's like a, a kind of dry, dry cognition, we say. If you only have meditation, but you don't have uh, wisdom, then uh, your direction, not clear. Where your meditation will take you, it's not clear. So two of these need to be practiced together. This is a still taught in Korean Zen uh, about prajna and samadhi. This is a jong he sang su. Prajna and samadhi must go up together. jong he sang su. So maybe I'll review some of that before we talked about what is uh, samadhi. And samadhi is a wisdom. And samadhi is meditation. Meditation means completely one mind. This unmoving mind. This means that uh, you're completely undistracted, no matter what happens. Most people are distracted all the time by things, but somebody who is in samadhi is undistracted. They are not uh, moved by anything. Do we call this a samadhi or meditation? But if we only attach to that point, if we only uh, get stuck and uh, only wish to be at that point, then we have a problem. We need to have some wisdom. For example, somebody uh, may really enjoy listening to a good song and repeating that song again and again, or a group, good music group, and they may put, uh, put it on their MP3 player and put it in their ears and all day walking around just playing that same music again over and over, and 
be completely mesmerized. They may only concentrate on that same music. But then when they cross the street, they don't stop to see the cars that are coming on. And some car comes and almost kills them. And somebody leans out and Hey, what happened? What are you doing? Don't, you idiot. Why don't you go to the crossing? But they're only oh, completely absorbed in this music. We say this is a, a one mind. This is a samadhi. Completely absorbed. Even the car is coming. Even uh, somebody comes to them and holds a gun to their head and says, Give me all your money. It's all like, wow. like this lovely music sound or lovely mantra that they're doing, whatever. But this is only one side of practicing. This is the meditation side. This is a one side of absorption, where we say samadhi. But the other side is what we call wisdom. We need to have some wisdom in order to moment to moment function clearly. So if they're, we're crossing the street and it's possible to cross at the crossing and go when the cars are not coming, we go that way. We don't almost cause an accident or maybe cause an accident. This means a wisdom. This means a, uh, not only think about my own situation, but think about everybody involved. So uh, from the time of this sixth patriarch, he said, Using prajna and samadhi together is correct practicing. Correct practicing, you cannot just have one. You need to also have, understand this uh, other one, this prajna and samadhi. And when he heard that, the visiting monk was enlightened, and he praised the patriarch, saying, Mind is originally Buddha, but I humiliated myself by not having attained it. Now I know the principal cause of prajna and samadhi, both of which... I shall practice to set myself free from all name and form. So, uh, he was able to attain enlightenment to that phrase, mind is originally Buddha. And this is uh, not only in the time of Sikh Pedra, but later, time of Maja Zen Master, he also taught that. Mind is Buddha. He also taught mind is, uh, there is no mind and no Buddha. After quite some years of teaching mind is Buddha, uh, he began to teach no mind, no Buddha. Maybe mind is Buddha became too worn out. Too many people uh, got attached to that phrase, so he changed it to no mind, no Buddha. In this uh, book about the sixth patriarch, there's also some stories about uh, monks who were uh, practicing the Lotus Sutra, and this next section here is about a monk who was uh, a monk since a very early age, seven years old, and his practice was to recite the Lotus Sutra. And those of you who know Buddhism maybe have read the Lotus Sutra, but uh, since many people probably have not, I will talk a little bit about that. It's also mentioned several times in this chapter. The Lotus Sutra... Uh, is a very famous sutra that uh, talks about the burning house and kind of like uses an allegory. Uh, there's a rich man and he has many sons. And these sons um, and him, they all live together in a big house, kind of mansion, a rich person's house. And the rich man has to go often to other parts of the country to do some business, to uh, trade things, to do many things, to, uh, take care of things and his business. And his sons, they were mostly just staying at home. And they would not go out of the house very much. And one day he uh, noticed that this house was getting kind of old and had some problems. And he uh, asked his sons to come out of the house so he could fix the house and repair the problems that it had. But his sons refused to leave the house. They said, no, this is our good house. This is a really, uh, this we've been here since we were children. 
we love this house, we love this area, we don't want to go out. And the next time he came back, uh, this house was on fire. And this house had many problems, it was burning. And he told his sons, you have to come out. You have to, he shouted at them, come out of the house. But his son still refused to come out. He said, no, Father, we've lived in this house since we were children. This is a wonderful house. This is our home. How can we leave this house? And at that point in the sutra, it explains that the father produced many toys that he had bought in other parts of the country. And these toys included bicycles and carts and various, like what nowadays we would say, various cars, various uh, fancy cars. And in those days, they just said like goat cart and deer cart and uh, uh, ox cart. But nowadays, we'd say like a, a Hyundai. He brought a gift of a Hyundai and he brought a gift of a, a Buick and he bought a gift of a, you know, a Ford and all these different cars. And he said to his, his sons, oh, look, I brought you these wonderful carts, these toys. Please come out. Quickly, come out of the house. And finally, they came out of the house. And they started to play with their new carts, their new toys. And the house burned, but they were not, uh, they were not hurt or killed. And so this is an allegory. The allegory is that the uh, burning house is kind of like the body and the world that we live in. And we don't want to leave that. We're attached to it. We don't want to come out of it. So some uh, buddy like the father comes along. The father actually in, in the story represents actually the Buddha or some teacher. And he says, look, I have toys. I have toys. Come play with these toys. And then by being attracted by these toys, the, the sons come out of the house. And so many uh, people have studied the Lotus Sutra. In fact, there's quite a uh, school in Korea just about this, the Lotus Sutra school. But what is interesting is that this Lotus Sutra is like an allegory. It's like a kind of metaphor for something bigger. If you don't see the bigger part, you can also uh, get stuck on the Lotus Sutra. So a monk who was named Fada, Bhikkhu Fada, his practice was to recite this Lotus Sutra. And when he came to pay his respects to the patriarch, he failed to lower his head to the ground. He failed to bow to him. And the sixth patriarch said, there must be something in your mind that makes you so puffed up. Tell me what you do in your daily practice. And he said, I recite the Lotus Sutra. I've read the whole text 3,000 times. That's a lot of times. It's a long book. Maybe we can see it on the on the shelf here, but it's quite a thick book. It's like, like one of these here. It's like a thick one, okay? And he's read it 3,000 times. And then the patriarch said, if you had grasped the meaning of the sutra, you would not have assumed such a lofty bearing. Even if you had read it 10,000 times, if you'd really grasped the meaning of it, even if you read it 10,000 times, you would not be so arrogant. Had you had grasped it, you would be treading the same path as mine. What you have accomplished has already made you conceited. And moreover, you don't seem to realize that this is wrong. So he kind of uh, scolded him a bit. Why don't, you, uh, why don't you really grasp the true meaning of the sutra? And he said, since the object of bowing is to curb arrogance, why did you fail to bow your head to the ground? Attaching to I is the source of sin. So when he says sin, it means like the source of uh, problems. But the tree to all attainment is empty, attains merit incomparable. So rather than thinking that you're so, that you've accomplished so much because you've recited this address 3,000 times, uh, you should treat that as empty. Treat all attainment as empty. And he said, your name is Fada, but you have not yet attained the Dharma. So even you recited the sutra 3,000 times, you haven't attained the Dharma. And he went on to tell him, 
why you are not you haven't attained the Dharma is because you only recited it with your lips. You only recited the text with your lips. And you didn't keep your mind clear. And he goes on to explain that. And he says, if you only believe that the Buddha speaks no words, then the lotus will blossom in your mouth. What does that mean? Well, everybody knows the Buddha spoke, but the true speech of the Buddha cannot be contained in words. True speech of the Buddha is beyond any kind of words. So that's why later the patriarchs in China said, if you really want to understand the speech of Buddha, you must listen to the waterfall. You must listen to the sound of the waterfall. You must listen to the sound of the ocean waves. And then you'll understand the true speech of the Buddha. And at, after that, the uh, patriarch then asked for his name. And he told his name was Fatah. And having heard this stanza, Fatah became remorseful and apologized to the patriarch. He said, afterwards, I will be humble. Hereafter, I'll be humble and polite on all occasions, as I do not quite understand the meaning of the sutra I recite. I am doubtful as to its proper interpretation. With your profound knowledge and high wisdom, will you give me, kindly give me a short explanation? And again, he, this patriarch scorned him. He said, Fatah, your, the Dharma is quite clear. It is only your mind that is not clear. And Sutra is free from doubtful passages. It is only your mind that makes them doubtful. When reciting, reciting the Sutra, do you know its main point? And he says, how can I know, sir, I'm, since I am so dull and stupid? All I know is how to recite it word by word. Well, most people are like that. Most people think, I'm really stupid, so I just know how to repeat the words. Or they think I'm dull, I have to repeat the words of the sutra many, many times before I can understand it. And so, the sixth patriarch, he couldn't read the sutra very, very much. He was illiterate. He said, so will you please recite the sutra for me because I can't read it myself. I'll then explain its meaning. And Fatah recited the sutra and he came to the chapter entitled Parables. And the patriarch stops him saying, the main theme of this sutra is to set forth the cause and reason of a Buddha's incarnation in this world. So he said that all the parables, all the illustrations in the book, for example, the one I told you about, the burning house, all these parables, none of them goes beyond the central point of the cause and the reason of a Buddha's appearing in this world. And what is that reason? What's that cause? And that reason, that cause, is for a sole reason, a sole purpose that the Buddha appears in, the, in this world. That sole cause, that sole reason is the insight of Buddha knowledge, and what we call Buddha knowledge. So what's Buddha knowledge? That means, Buddha means enlightenment. So it means the knowledge of enlightenment. So basically what he's talking about is to become enlightened, to know what it is to be enlightened, and to awake to the insight of enlightenment knowledge, and to be firmly established in the enlightenment knowledge. And he goes through those four gates. And he said that you should not misinterpret the text and come to the conclusion that Buddha knowledge is something special to Buddha and not common to us all. Most people come to that conclusion, that only Buddha has Buddha knowledge, that we normal people don't have Buddha knowledge, but this is a mistake. Even though we are not special, we all have Buddha knowledge. We all have the Buddha nature. So we all have the possibility to uh, know what is enlightenment. We all have that, but many times uh, people think that this is only special to common to Buddhas or Zen masters. All these Zen masters or Buddhas can have that knowledge. So he goes on to say, you should therefore accept the interpretation that 
Buddha knowledge is the Buddha knowledge of your own mind and not that of any other Buddha. So when they're talking about Buddha knowledge, they mean really what they mean is that you know yourself, not that you know some Buddha somewhere else, that you know your own mind. Do you know your own mind? Do you know your true self? This is really what they are pointing at. And so many people, when they first read this sutra, they think they're talking about some other Buddha far away. But really what he's talking about is their, your own mind and how well you know that. And he goes on to say that human beings shut themselves from, off from their own original bright light by being infatuated with external objects and tormented by inner disturbances. And so he goes on to explain uh, in many ways that we should not look outside that if you can do this, you and Buddha are not too. So that's why the sutra says, open your mind to true knowing and seeing. So this is a little, uh, actually this is a little old way of teaching Zen, older way of teaching Zen. This is original uh, patriarchal Zen teaching that the Sixth Patriarch gave. Nowadays, we don't talk so much about uh, the Lord Buddha had to leave his samadhi and all this, not so much to explain. But we talk about the mind a lot. But it was the first, he was the first patriarch who talked about that the mind is everything, that the mind, inside your mind is the Buddha knowledge, that your mind contains everything. So he advises, he says, I also advise everyone to open their mind moment to moment to the true knowledge and the seeing of Buddha. Worldly people's minds are not correct. Through ignorance and illusion, they commit many offenses. They speak good words, but their minds are wicked. So we oftentimes, we see that. Uh, people who praise us, who say, oh, you're so intelligent, you're so wonderful, you're so good, we don't really feel like we can trust them. We hear them, if somebody tells you, oh, yeah, I really like what you're doing, but it's really good. It's easy to be suspect that uh, they're not really they're not really thinking the same way with their mind. They're just giving you lip service. Maybe somebody who really criticizes you and really gives you a hard time is actually your good friend. But somebody who just praises you with their lips but is not, not really sincere, this is not your friend. This is a... Uh, many times we have this experience in our life and also uh, there's some truth about that. Their greed and hatred, jealousy, deceit, flattery, and arrogance violates others and harms the world. So if you act like this, you're opening yourself to the knowing and seeing of worldly people. If you can make your mind correct moment to moment and give birth to wisdom, perceive your mind, stop evil and do good, then this is manifesting true knowing and seeing. So you should therefore, moment to moment, open your mind, not for worldly knowledge, but for super mundane Buddha knowledge. This means the knowledge of enlightenment. You need to understand your mind and how it becomes enlightened. This is basically what he's saying. On the other hand, if you stick to the arbitrary idea that the mere recitation of the sutra as a daily exercise is good enough, then you are infatuated like the yak or like a dog, with its own tail. You know, many times dogs are obsessed with their tail. I, I didn't know that yaks are obsessed with their tail. Don't have much experience with yaks, but... Nowadays, uh, we don't see many yaks here in Korea. But we do see dogs, and dogs are obsessed with their tail. So many times this happens when people uh, undertake some spiritual practice. When they first start, their mind is very fresh and very clear. And they undertake it with a really sincere commitment. And they really try hard. But after some time, they become a little jaded. They start to count. Oh, how many days have I been doing this spiritual practice? And, and I'm better than that person who didn't do this. And they start to compare. The mind of comparison appears. They start to compare. Well, I'm doing this transcendental meditation and reciting this mantra every day. 50 times, and he's not doing it, so I'm, that makes me better. 
I'm more pure, I'm more holy, I'm more this, I'm more that. And this is all like chasing your own tail. You miss the whole point. Originally the whole point was not to compare, not to uh, make differences between yourself and others. Does anybody have a question? No question? Then we can finish today. Mm. Okay.